I just wondering if Jerry could give us a little bit more information on the linkages between these expenditures and how that translates into mitigation. It struck me as uh, I was curious as to how you can actually plan a strategy if you don't really know what you're planning for. I mean, you have these wetter versus drier environments. For example, your returns to irrigation investments would vary significantly what, which one of those environments uh, actually uh, occurred. Similarly, uh, agricultural research, what kind of research do you need to undertake depends on what climate you'll be, you'll be trying to mitigate for. So how do you account for those in, in your model? Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, Phyllis? Yes, sir. Right here. And if you could follow the president there to n mention your name and affiliation. Bob Bird, uh, World Academy of Art and Science. I wonder whether I could just make a suggestion that these kinds of projections be kept in pencil and that we not, as an audience, that we uh, applaud updating of them because the UNEP uh, uh, calculations that just came out 10 days ago or so uh, really force us to, to think uh, that we're going to need to update on a fairly frequent uh, uh, basis on this and I wonder that might be an opportunity then to to incorporate all these things that that haven't been incorporated now, particularly <coughs> as you as you well mentioned, the the uh, projected damages in the Mekong and the, and the other rice growing <coughs> areas, which will really affect price and availability uh, tremendously. Okay. Thank you very much. Over here, Seth Bornstein, the Associated Press. Can you do you think you can give us some specific examples where? We've seen you're seeing agricultural adaptation programs for climate change already in work, in work, and uh, being effective or not being effective. You know, locations and actual what the adaptation is there. And one more down here, and then we'll we'll just have some feedback, and then go. Yes, please. Yeah. I'm Deborah Hines from the Global Environmental Facility, and I was just wondering how you defined malnutrition in your model and when you talked about calorie consumption did you talk did you factor in types of calories in other words utilization and when we begin to look at malnourished children and malnourished people under different climate change scenarios are you factoring in the quality of food because this is a, a major factor in in terms of you know, increasing healthy populations. Okay. Thanks. So we'll turn it back to you. Or do you want to take a first crack at those? Or? Yes, and I will also call on some other team members to, to include you, Mark, to respond to some of these things. Um, so the first question the, of Keith with respect to how do you plan for this, um, the, the short answer, I guess I would say, is that first of all, capacity building is critical because we've really drawn down our capacity to do agricultural research and, and, and extension delivery of that information. Um, but the other point I would make is that while there is substantial variability and variability across the two scenarios, and of course if you have more scenarios you end up with more variability, the, the There we go. Yeah, I'm not sure what the message was, though. Uh, the the there will be envir environments in the future that are like environments today, so that the distribution may change of a particular agroecological zone today may change. It may move in different directions. It may move to different places, um, but there will still be those zones in the future. There will be some places where we move outside of the bounds of what we know today, but where those are exactly we don't know. I think there's plenty to do to get ready for the challenges that we face in the short run, which are as much food security challenges are the, as they are a immediate adaptation to climate change. I totally support the idea of keeping the estimates in pencil rather than in pen, um, aside from the issue of employment for economists, which is always a good thing. Um, these numbers really are moving. As we get better estimates of climate change, as we do a better job of understanding some of the uncertainties that exist with climate change, and of course the, the details of the model. So, you know, I wouldn't ever want to see these numbers quoted five years from now as being the gospel from five years. They need to, we need to continue working on the updating. Having said that, 
one can engage in a how many angels dance on the head of a pin discussion about this as well. There's actually seems to be a bit of a convergence on the magnitude of the cost of dealing with climate change. The $7 billion number is a number that uh, have come up in a, in a different variety, fora in, in slightly different, and very different in some cases, methodologies. And so in some sense, while we need to continue to refine the est estimates and update them, we also need to start acting today. Um, pro pro programs already in, in work. I can just give you one. Uh, so, so adaptation with respect to agriculture, climate change adaptation in the agricultural sector goes on, of course, all the time. Farmers choose new varieties to deal with with their situations. They, s they spend money on irrigation systems. They, they uh, work with farmer organizations to get roads built. And those sorts of things are going on in any case. Just one small anecdote. A, a colleague of, of, of many of ours, people in the room, was traveling through Bihar the other day and found, um, and Bihar is a very poor region of, the, of India, and found farmers growing hybrid maize and hybrid rice. And they were growing hybrid maize to uh, supply the burgeoning chicken um, business in, in India. And they were growing hybrid rice because it actually does, it is robust to drought. And um, they're growing it on their more marginal lands. So that's an example of some of the things that are already actually in the field going on. There's a fair amount of research that's being undertaken by international research centers, the CG system, and as some national research centers um, in both in the developing world and the developed world to deal with drought tolerance. and, and and ability to deal with uh, greater changes in water. Um, um, and I should add, of course, the private sector is also spending a lot of money on this as well. Quality uh, of food, we don't deal with quality issues. It's strict calorie measures. Um, and the relationship that we use is one that was developed by colleagues of, I think, Schengen is in the room, and I think he was responsible for some of these numbers. And so the details of how that's done, we can come back to later on. Um, but what we try to do is to find um, academic, peer-reviewed estimates of the linkages between actually a variety of drivers of malnutrition, not just calorie drivers, um, and then their effects on climate, uh, on malnutrition. And so then when we change calorie availability through agricultural productivity, that statistical relationship tells us the number of malnourished children. Your points about calorie uh, quality are something that we don't have, have not taken into account. Let me just add, yeah, add a couple of points. Yeah, the, the measure uses weight, uh, weight for height measures uh, that, that, that were from US, uh, UN SCN was, was the source of the data for the estimations. And, and as Jerry says, we can't do the, the pure quality effects. So we do have calories from all sources, including not just the cereals we saw here, but of course roots and tubers, vegetables, meats, and so forth. Uh, right. Uh, a bit more on, on uh, Keith's question. Yeah, I mean, the differentiation comes through the fact that the models do. Uh, you know, you know, so we, we plug in, first of all, different, the pr production shocks are different for the two scenarios, so we plug those separately into the economic model, the impact model, but we, and we also have a water supply and demand model so, the, the, so that the revealed water supply and, uh, available for irrigation is also different in the two. In terms of the investments, right now it is a fairly, uh, again, a fairly aggregate estimate based on elasticities uh, of pro productivity of investments. We're also working with Stan, Stan Wood and his team eventually to be able to try to look at specific crop traits and how investment in different crop traits in different regions can can uh, can contribute uh, can uh, can better refine the estimates. Those uh, those aren't uh, in place uh, yet. Just one other quick point on the adaptation question: that uh, uh, the best place to look really uh, for uh, successful adaptation is really adaptation is sort of short-term coping uh, in in adaptation in agriculture. One one of the best examples uh, to date is. Uh, in Bangladesh and in, in, in how they, they've adapted to uh, the periodic cy uh, cyclones in, in the Delta region and have greatly reduced uh, b both human lives lost and, and, uh, and, the, co and the economic costs to, uh, to those cyclones, even equally severe ones to previously. So it's best, it look, as Jerry pointed out, there's not much out there in terms of explicit climate change adaptation, but the sort of coping to weather variability is, is the best place to look for those. Another round of uh, questions, uh, yes, back here. Oh, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, David. Oh, sorry um, about that. Well, just on that last question about successful programs, I think it is important to think about climate change um, adaptation in two ways. One is um, that, um, as Mark was, was suggesting, many of the responses that are needed are ones that are needed for underlying cl climate variability. But 
the extent to which they need to be undertaken um, becomes all the greater. And um, so Bangladesh is an example. I think drip irrigation is an example of, of an approach that clearly in many um, relatively water scarce regions was already appropriate, but now is going to be all the more so. Then there's a whole nother set of, uh, of kind of adaptation responses that I think are, are new, have to be new. Um, for instance, um, in the Himalayas where we're seeing lots of glacial melt, and that in the short term is creating flooding um, that in many ways wasn't previously, ex previously experienced, and in the longer term is going to create water scarcity as the, as the um, glaciers no longer provide the spring melt that, they're, uh, that, that used to be the case. And so there will need to be entirely new um, kinds of responses in, in those kinds of circumstances. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's we'll start over. I had one over here and then. The outcomes on children for future development, the earn potential earnings, and eventually the GDP of countries. So, this is really great. Um, I have a quite specific question relating to the Middle East. Would you look at your table six and um, the numbers in column two, three, and four? It looks like child malnourishment is going to go up by 100% in the Middle East. Or am I reading that wrong? And then one thing you didn't mention is how much it actually costs to adapt to climate change in the Middle East. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Sarah Moon. Oh, sorry, over here, uh, Meryl, sorry, Sarah Moon. Yeah. Sarah Moon, Chapleton, USAID. Uh, Jerry, the, the wheat data you presented, I think, I think it was the yield data looking at really serious declines in South Asia for wheat, if I remember correctly. Is that due to precipitation or temperature? And that was sort of much higher than any of the other crops you presented. What's behind that? Yes, sir. Uh, I would like to know. Sorry, wait for the mic, sir. Yeah. Uh, Millage Walker, American University. Uh, I'd like to know how. Uh, such variables as migration and employment figure into uh, agricultural research on these issues. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, that's a quiet crowd today. Uh, David or Jerry, do you want to open up first? Or David, do you want to start off? Go ahead. You get some stuff? No, no. Okay. Um, well, I, I'm at a disadvantage on the Middle East because I haven't looked at that table in a little while. Somewhere in that report, there are numbers on the cost of adaptation in the Middle East. Um, but I, I guess I don't have anything particular to say about the Middle East uh, mal malnourished children count. Um, yeah, the wheat yield decline numbers are, um, are dramatic. And um, I guess I would have to say that they're the ones that I'm least comfortable with in the sense that we've had more problems on the biological modeling of wheat than we have any of the other crops, which is not to say that there aren't lots of issues with the other crops. But um, in general in the world, dealing with, uh, with winter wheat is a challenge in this whole modeling effort. But just some general comments about wheat. Uh, higher temperatures, of course, are a, a problem for wheat when you're already at the sort of the edges of the wheat variety, uh, wheat to the temperature tolerance of the variety that we have. And then um, in irrigated yields, the, we actually do two different ways of looking at the effects of changes in water availability on irrigated yields. So the straight biological yield effects that we resort for irrigated crops are purely temperature effects. But then we build in the water stress because of growing industrial demand um, for water that takes away water from agriculture. So a combination of those two effects on wheat yields in Sub-Saharan and South Asia in particular cause, I suspect, some of the yields. This is one of those things, though, however, where the number should be seen as being in pencil rather than, than in pen. And, and the short answer to migration and employment is that we don't actually deal with those particular issues in this analysis. 
Just might mention that the Asian Development Bank in a companion study to this has a study on the uh, climate change and migration. It's not quite ready yet, but if you'd send me an uh, email, ask, I'll, I'll make sure you get that when it, when it comes out. But it wasn't something we directly looked at. So, Any more questions? Do you have any more from the, uh, yeah, oh, Richard, yeah. John, John Lewis, Terra Global Capital. Just come from a meeting <clears throat> on the Commission on Climate and Tropical Forests, um, and uh, there was no discussion of agriculture, even though that's a major driver of deforestation in that meeting. And then here, um, I'd just like to throw something that perhaps could be on this agenda, having told them what should be on their agenda, or <laughs> requested that agriculture as a driver of deforestation get on their agenda is perennial agriculture, this question of uh, whole civilizations used to feed themselves on perennial food crops. And we're looking at wheat and maize and rice here. And uh, maybe there's, uh, there's a very, that was a very interesting discussion on the transition from adaptation programming to Mitigation readiness, which of course can be a revenue earner for vulnerable populations, agricultural, food insecure populations, and perennial agriculture would be certainly the best of both worlds. Um, and uh, so that would perhaps be a, a new line of inquiry, and I'm just wondering what the CG system is doing in that respect. Can I, can I ask you just a quick clarification, John? Are you talking about like adapting uh, breeding rice to be a perennial, for example, things like that, or you? Or no, no, no. Okay. Breadfruit. Okay. Yams. Perennial food crop. Okay, gotcha. Ones that, sorry, ones that would uh, also obviously have a afforestation, reforestation, and forest protection mitigation crediting benefit, <coughs> and therefore be revenue earners beyond their sustainable agriculture. Right, thank you. Was I missing people back here? Yeah. Please, yeah. Hello, yeah. Good afternoon, my name is Philip Chabot from the Foreign Agricultural Service. My question was, um, maybe I need to be paying closer attention to this issue, but my recollection was there was earlier modeling work done five or 10 years ago that was showing reasonable significant gains in productivity in the North American cereal sector and in the Corn Belt in particular, and your models are showing something considerably different, and then you also said you're gonna look into this more closely, and I wanted to know if you cared to comment on that further. Thanks. Jerry, did you wanna uh, speak of that? You might also bring in, the, following John's question, this issue of getting agriculture and forestry together that you've been, uh, you've been working on in terms of the Copenhagen process. Right. Yeah. I mean, John didn't explicitly ask this question, but that's all right. Um, the silos between sort of the agriculture community and the forestry community are still pretty hard and fast, and, and we're trying to break some of those down um, in a series of, of um, events in Copenhagen that will try to coordinate across agriculture and forestry activities within a set of recommendations to the negotiators and others out of that collective effort. We'll see whether we're actually successful. I don't have any particular comments on perennial agriculture. Um, the, the, corn, the Corn Belt story, yeah, the Corn Belt story is a, is a more general one. If you look back at, at the, the literature on the role of agriculture and climate change, both in terms of impacts and adaptation, it's that agriculture was seen as not being terribly bad from, uh, badly affected from a global perspective, that is, Wherever we were going to have good effects and where we were going to have bad effects, they weren't going to be really bad in either good in either direction, and trade flows would equilibrate. And, of course, really key to all of this was carbon fertilization. So the recent results suggest that carbon fer we shouldn't count a lot on carbon fertilization anymore, um, and that Doha Round, the fact that Doha Round hasn't progressed is not good, it does not necessarily give us confidence that tr agricultural trade flows will help. Um, but the... The underlying um, biological issue with respect to, to, in particular, corn, now maize yields in the United States, has very much to do with the, the particular GCM that you look at. We've only begun to explore across a wider range of GCMs 
not doing like the UNFCC does, which is to average all 18 of the major GCMs together under the argument that they are all equally likely and therefore an average is as good as we can do with, but instead trying to explore the variability across the GCMs. And what we're beginning to find, uh, and I'm going to just say this with a great deal of caution and its early results, um, to suggest that in fact the Corn Belt doesn't do so well under a lot of the GCMs. So, you know, that's a result that we'll hopefully have something more to say about in the, in the not too distant future. But that's about as far as I want to go right now. Um, on this question about perennials and forests and so forth, I, I think it's, that's right, that we need to be much more focused on some of these interactions and overlaps between agriculture and, and forestry. I think one of the questions is how exactly we would go about doing that on the mitigation side of things. Um, I think. Uh, carbon crediting is one approach, um, but I think there's still some level of understanding that we need to get to in terms of the measurable, uh, reportable, verifiable, uh, the, the, the sort of um, secret handshake word <laughs> that's emerged from the um, negotiations, um, how, how that would play out um, in, in these arenas. And um, I, I think that what that points to in many ways is it, it, what is very clear is that it's time to put some investments into capacity building, institution building, and so forth in the in um, the area of agriculture mitigation and its relationship to some of these other areas so that we can get to the point that we know when um, MRV, as it's um, being referred to, um, is something we can actually achieve. Okay, thanks. I had one up here and then in, in the back for Jewel and then back there. Thank you. I'm Rajul Pandya Loach with IFPRI. I have a question for David. I really appreciated the uh, landscape that you walked us through uh, with the negotiations and the like. I wondered two questions. What do you see as the role of developing countries uh, in um, putting these issues most squarely on the table in Copenhagen? How effective will they be? Could they be? What's needed to get their effectiveness up? And coming after Copenhagen, you mentioned that um, more of the details would be likely worked out after Copenhagen. Where do you see the potential allies or alliances to keep this issue most squarely on the table after Copenhagen? Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. Then we have a person in the back. Let's stand right here. Hi, Myra Caldera from USDA. Uh, my question is on biotechnology. There is a lot of environmental groups that see biotech crops as negative impacts on the environment, but I. I'm just curious how you see that playing a role in adaptation into future yields um, for crops. And if the, the biotechnology discussion will also happen at Copenhagen, and should it be, it should it. Thank you, and then one, one here, please. Yeah. Hi, Demetrius Hale, also from the Foreign Agricultural Service, USDA. I had a question about, um, you mentioned that trade flows may help to mitigate some of the negative impact that um, that we'll see as a result of climate change. I, is there any other clarifying statement that you can provide with regard to that? Gary, uh, let's come back, Gary. I can take the biotech one if you want. If you, or if you want, you can do it. Go ahead, David. Um, I was going to start with the um, question about developing countries in Copenhagen. Um, I think that we're beginning to see um, much more outspokenness on the part of developing countries on the agriculture front. Um, we've been seeing that from uh, African countries, and Ethiopia has recently assumed a much more prominent uh, role in the African negotiating bloc for the negotiation and, and has made clear that it sees investments in agriculture, um, both for uh, adaptation and mitigation, as a key element in the negotiations. Um, just last week in, in Bangkok, Bangladesh, was more, much more outspoken and clear on the issue of uh, mitigation in the agricultural realm and, and their desire to have that really be on the table. So I think we see a, a bit of a, a, a gathering of forces um, from developing countries. And I, I think that that's likely to continue. I, I think um, you know, there, there will be efforts um, in Copenhagen to really draw attention to these issues, and I think it will continue to build in the wake of that. Um, on the, the biotech question, let me just quickly give our perspective, and that I think 
there may be more details uh, coming from IFPRI, but from our perspective, there um, are a lot of traditional crop varieties that we need to begin by building off of, and we've seen that already in some countries like Malawi, Malawi where traditional varieties of potatoes that hadn't been used for years have proven very helpful. Um, in terms of biotech itself, our view is that that's really a decision to be made by communities and countries themselves. Um, in what cases they do or do not decide to use them, it's really not our decision, but theirs. Yeah, just following up. Yeah, I, th I think it's, that's perfectly correct that there needs to be a tapping as much as possible of, of the existing genetic variation in, in terms of also bringing back land races and traditional varieties that haven't been planted. I suspect also though in the, in the medium and longer term run though, it, it, the amount of stresses that are out there in terms of drought tolerance, salinity tolerance, heat tolerance, probably will eventually require tapping into uh, uh, GM uh, approaches. There's interesting approaches now in, in West Africa for development of drought tolerant maize, which is using both, in a sense, tapping into both strands, using uh, the uh, non-transgenic and transgenic approaches. I think that's a, a valuable way where the resources are available to try to, to look at the progress in both of those. It's likely, I think, b both will have to be very, sig uh, very significant tools. Uh, Jerry, did you want to? Let me follow up a bit on this ex ex um, exploiting existing genetic variation. I think one of the things that we, again, humans have really done a horrible job is characterization of the, of the attributes of the existing genetic material. Um, and so, uh, and, and then sharing that information globally. So I have proposed in other places that what we should seriously consider doing is to having a series of research sites around the world, which could be already existing sites that the national programs have, the international centers have, or new ones, where we um, hit all of today's climate conditions with the understanding that today's climate in a particular location may be tomorrow's climate someplace else. Um, and then we, we test all of the genetic material with the eye to characterizing it for a variety of attributes, um, but including climate change. And we use a common protocol so that we have information in a consistent framework format, so, and then we share that information widely. So we need to take some of the material that, we need to take all of the material that are in the gene banks, for example, and do this to it. Um, and that includes existing genetic, traditional, so so-called tr traditional genetic var var varieties as well as modern varieties. To come back to the trade flow qu question, I'm going to do a little tech talk here. Um, you, as an economist, I realize not everyone in the room is an economist, but as an economist, one way to think about the effects of climate change is that it will change comparative advantage. And for those of you who can remember that confusing discussion about comparative advantage in your Econ 1 class, um, when comparative advantage changes, th the ideal thing that we should be doing is to exploit comparative advantage to its fullest, which is why economists universally argue for freer trade. Changing comparative advantage means that we, in order to exploit that comparative advantage, we need to change the ways in which we trade with each other so that freer trade flows makes it possible for us to exploit that comparative advantage or just in a less technical terms to take advantage of the changing advantages. So that's what the argument about changing trade flows does even without more liberal agricultural trade, more free agricultural trade. But freer agricultural trade would make that adjustment process work smoothly, more rapidly, and to the benefit of more people sooner. Okay. Uh, Gordon. Uh, Gordon Conway, Imperial College, London. Uh, just to congratulate you, first of all, it's been incredibly frustrating that agriculture has been neglected in climate change discussions and research. I mean, my guess is that agriculture as a sector is going to suffer more than any other sector in the future from climate change. I can't put a figure on it, maybe you can, but my guess is that's true. Um, you've been downscaling the GCMs for your modeling, and I wonder whether what you've now got is something that an individual country could take. In other words, can Ghana or Malawi, not Rwanda because it's too small, but could they downscale and work out what's going to happen? Uh, my other comment is about adaptation. I mean, it was interesting, the only question from the press was what are examples of adaptation? I think that's exactly right. If we're going to have to spend seven billion, they want to know what on earth we're going to spend it on. 
And so I think the more examples there are of, of adaptation, the better. Um, one, of course, is minimum tillage. Uh, I recently saw in Zimbabwe farmers using min minimum tillage uh, getting two tons per hectare from uh, hybrid maize, uh, where farmers who weren't using minimum tillage were getting nothing in a drought year. Um, and the other, of course, interesting example is the reverse, where you're getting increased minimum temperatures in the winter and the movement of winter wheat northwards. Northern China, the winter wheat goes up every year. Of course, the reverse is the apple crops are suffering all over the world and nobody quite knows how to deal with that. But unless we get these examples, nobody's going to buy into seven billion. All right. Yeah, right. Thank you. This gentleman right here, Amir. Uh, Ken Verisub, uh, USAID. Uh, I wanted to point out that there is a, a crop that has been extensively studied for natural variation and that that natural variation has been used to predict what the impact of climate change would be on that crop. It happens to be wine grapes and the economics are very different but as a model for a way of approaching what kinds of research might be done and how we might go about it, it might be worthwhile looking at all of the research that's been done in that field and see what lessons we can learn from that. Time for one or two more, if anybody. Okay, Jerry, David. Wine grapes, what a great topic. <laughs> I was asked actually uh, in the West Coast in uh, in southern part of Washington State where they are actually getting very much prepared for the coming climate change. And so, yes, there's a lot of research going on. It's a, it's a high value crop and a high value crop where you're putting root stock in the ground and it's there for a while. So you both have the incentive to look ahead 10, 15, 20 years, but also the financial resources to do it. So the private sector, I guess I'm not too worried about the private sector handling the wine stock, but it's the public sector. And one of the things we haven't emphasized enough is the distinction between private and public sector uh, needs for research. And so many of the varieties and uh, the crops that we're talking about, the public sector well, the private sector uh, does not have the financial incentive necessarily to deal with um, too small a market, open pollinated, um, all of these sorts of problems that go along with the reasons why private sector is not necessarily going to invest in them. And the public sector has disinvested in them or at least reduced its investment quite dramatically because of the declining food prices. So the, 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 the increase in the food price crisis of last year was a bit of a wake-up call, and we hope we can continue the attention that's paid to it and adding climate change on top of the problem that we're going to have because of more people and higher incomes just makes the urgency of dealing with this and dealing with having the public sector play a much more important role than it has in the recent past is, is really important. To get to your downscaling question, we do downscale. The, the, the level of analysis in the reports that are uh, report that's result presented here are a half degree which is um, somebody's going to correct me if I get this wrong so I'll just throw out a number it's about 70 kilometers at the equator I'm looking at you Ricky yeah so so 70 kilometers um, at the equator is the resolution for the climate numbers that we're working with and we have results that are downscaled further and we'll be pre presenting some of those you get in real trouble, however, if you try to talk to climate modelers about this because they are in some ways excessively pure in their science on, on what, what is appropriate to do. Um, and occasionally I say, consider the alternatives, which is that we don't do anything, we don't provide any information to national decision makers, which is what they're crying for now. So we have a project going on that's in fact working in sub-Saharan Africa where what we want to do is to provide more detailed information at the country level, but also the information about the differences across the, the GCMs, so that to the extent all the GCMs agree in one particular place about the outcomes, we'll be able to say that. But more likely what we'll be able to say is that, you know, even, if, even with the best downscaling that we can do today, it's really hard to tell whether, you know, just to make up something, northern Tanzania will get drier or wetter in the future. And you need to recognize that that uncertainty still exists, and you need to think about how to deal with the, all of the potential outcomes. David, do you want to um, 
On this question of the need for examples, um, I absolutely agree that's a critical task. There are efforts underway, for example, UNDP has one in place to catalog adaptation efforts, uh, successful adaptation efforts. The, the other thing I would just note is I would commend to you the McKinsey, um, Swiss Re, Rockefeller, et al. study um, that came out uh, a couple of weeks ago. It looks at adaptation approaches. It essentially tries to develop a cost curve, which I think is, is tricky to do, but um, for adaptation um, approaches and uh, looks at the cost benefit of various different adaptation approaches in eight different, eight different countries. It has some flaws, I think. There's some quibbles I have with it, but I do think it helps um, begin to lay out a path for us to be able to think about what is going to um, be most successful, including in economic terms for countries. It, it has, yeah, it, uh, for example, in some countries, drip irrigation is one of the most uh, cost ben beneficial approaches available.